This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Anna Roberts. Cleopatra by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 6. Cleopatra and Caesar. Cleopatra's perplexity. She resolves to go to Alexandria. Cleopatra's message to Caesar. Caesar's reply. Apollodorus's stratagem. Cleopatra and Caesar. First impressions. Caesar's attachment. Caesar's wife. His fondness for Cleopatra. Cleopatra's foes. She commits her cause to Caesar. Caesar's pretensions. He sends for Ptolemy. Ptolemy's indignation. His complaints against Caesar. Great tumult in the city. Excitement of the populace. Caesar's forces. Ptolemy made prisoner. Caesar's address to the people. Its effects. The mob dispersed. Caesar convenes an assembly. Caesar's decision. Satisfaction of the assembly. Festivals and rejoicings. Pothinus and Achilles. Plot of Pothinus and Achilles. Escape of Achilles. March of the Egyptian army. Measures of Caesar. Murder of the messengers. Intentions of Achilles. Cold-blooded assassination. Advance of Achilles. Caesar's arrangements for defense. Cleopatra and Ptolemy. Double dealing of Pothinus. He is detected. Pothinus beheaded. Arsinoe and Ganymede. Flight of Arsinoe. She is proclaimed queen by the army. Perplexity of the young Ptolemy. In the meantime, while the events related in the last chapter were taking place at Alexandria, Cleopatra remained anxious and uneasy in her camp, quite uncertain, for a time, what it was best for her to do. She wished to be at Alexandria. She knew very well that Caesar's power in controlling the course of affairs in Egypt would necessarily be supreme. She was, of course, very earnest in her desire to be able to present her cause before him. As it was, Ptolemy and Pothinus were in communication with the arbiter, and, for aught she knew, assiduously cultivating his favor, while she was far away, her cause unheard, her wrongs unknown, and perhaps even her existence forgotten. Of course, under such circumstances, she was very earnest to get to Alexandria. But how to accomplish this purpose was a source of great perplexity. She could not march thither at the head of an army, for the army of the king was strongly entrenched at Pelusium, and effectually barred the way. She could not attempt to pass alone, or with few attendants, through the country, for every town and village was occupied with garrisons and officers under the orders of Pothinus, and she would be certainly intercepted. She had no fleet, and could not, therefore, make the passage by sea. Besides, even if she could by any means reach the gates of Alexandria, how was she to pass safely through the streets of the city to the palace where Caesar resided, since the city, except in Caesar's quarters, was wholly in the hands of Pothinus's government? The difficulties in the way of accomplishing her object seemed thus almost insurmountable. She was, however, resolved to make the attempt. She sent a message to Caesar, asking permission to appear before him and plead her own cause. Caesar replied, urging her by all means to come. She took a single boat, and with the smallest number of attendants possible, made her way along the coast to Alexandria. The man on whom she principally relied in this hazardous expedition was a domestic named Apollodorus. She had, however, some other attendants besides. When the party reached Alexandria, they waited until night, then advanced to the foot of the walls of the citadel. Here Apollodorus rolled the queen up in a piece of carpeting, and covering the whole package with the cloth, he tied it with a thong, so as to give it the appearance of a bale of ordinary merchandise, and then throwing the load across his shoulder, he advanced into the city. Cleopatra was at this time about twenty-one years of age, but she was of a slender and graceful form, and the burden was, consequently, not very heavy. Apollodorus came to the gates of the palace where Caesar was residing. The guards at the gates asked him what it was that he was carrying. He said that it was a present for Caesar. So they allowed him to pass, and the pretended porter carried his package in safely. When it was unrolled and Cleopatra came out to view, Caesar was perfectly charmed with the spectacle. In fact, the various conflicting emotions, which she could not but feel under such circumstances as these, imparted a double interest to her beautiful and expressive face, and to her naturally bewitching manners. She was excited by the adventure through which she had passed, and yet pleased with her narrow escape from its dangers. The curiosity and interest which she felt on the one hand, in respect to the great personage into whose presence she had been thus strangely ushered, was very strong, but then, on the other hand, it was chastened and subdued by that feeling of timidity which, in new and unexpected situations like these, 
and under a consciousness of being the object of eager observation to the other sex, is inseparable from the nature of women. The conversation which Caesar held with Cleopatra deepened the impression which her first appearance had made upon him. Her intelligence and animation, the originality of her ideas, and the point and pertinency of her mode of expressing them, made her, independently of her personal charms, an exceedingly entertaining and agreeable companion. She, in fact, completely won the great conqueror's heart, and, through the strong attachment to her which he immediately formed, he became wholly disqualified to act impartially between her and her brother in regard to their respective rights to the crown. We call Ptolemy Cleopatra's brother, for, though he was also in fact her husband, still, as he was only ten or twelve years of age at the time of Cleopatra's expulsion from Alexandria, the marriage had been probably regarded thus far only as a mere matter of form. Caesar was now about fifty-two. He had a wife, named Calpurnia, to whom he had been married about ten years. She was living at this time in an unostentatious and quiet manner at Rome. She was a lady of an amiable and gentle character, devotedly attached to her husband, patient and forbearing in respect to his faults, and often anxious and unhappy at the thought of the difficulties and dangers in which his ardent and unbounded ambition so often involved him. Caesar immediately began to take a very strong interest in Cleopatra's cause. He treated her personally with the fondest attention, and it was impossible for her not to reciprocate, in some degree, the kind feeling with which he regarded her. It was, in fact, something altogether new to her to have a warm and devoted friend espousing her cause, tendering her protection, and seeking in every way to promote her happiness. Her father had all his life neglected her. Her brother, of years and understanding totally inferior to hers, whom she had been compelled to make her husband, had been her mortal enemy. It is true that, in depriving her of her inheritance and expelling her from her native land, he had been only the tool and instrument of more designing men. This, however, far from improving the point of view from which she regarded him, made him appear not only hateful but contemptible too. All the officers of government, also, in the Alexandrian court had turned against her, because they had supposed that they could control her brother more easily if she were away. Thus she had always been surrounded by selfish, mercenary, and implacable foes. Now, for the first time, she seemed to have a friend. A protector had suddenly arisen to support and defend her. A man of very alluring person and manners, of a very noble and generous spirit, and of the very highest station. He loved her, and she could not refrain from loving him in return. She committed her cause entirely into his hands, confided to him all her interests, and gave herself up wholly into his power. Nor was the unbounded confidence which she reposed in him undeserved, so far as related to his efforts to restore her to her throne. The legions which Caesar had sent for into Syria had not yet arrived, and his situation in Alexandria was still very defenceless and very precarious. He did not, however, on this account, abate in the least degree the loftiness and self-confidence of the position which he had assumed, but he commenced immediately the work of securing Cleopatra's restoration. This quiet assumption of the right and power to arbitrate and decide such a question as that of the claim to the throne, in a country where he had accidentally landed and found rival claimants disputing for the succession, while he was still wholly destitute of the means of enforcing the superiority which he so coolly assumed, marks the immense ascendancy which the Roman power had attained at this time in the estimation of mankind, and is, besides, specially characteristic of the genius and disposition of Caesar. Very soon after Cleopatra had come to him, Caesar sent for the young Ptolemy, and urged him the duty and expediency of restoring Cleopatra. Ptolemy was beginning now to attain an age at which he might be supposed to have some opinion of his own on such a question. He declared himself utterly opposed to any such design. In the course of the conversation he learned that Cleopatra had arrived at Alexandria, and that she was then concealed in Caesar's palace. This intelligence awakened in his mind the greatest excitement and indignation. He went away from Caesar's palace in a rage. He tore the diadem which he was accustomed to wear in the streets from his head, threw it down, and trampled it under his feet. He declared to the people that he was betrayed, and displayed the most violent indications of vexation and chagrin. The chief subject of his complaint, in the attempts which he made to awaken the popular indignation against Caesar and the Romans, was the disgraceful impropriety of the position which his sister had assumed in surrendering herself as she had done to Caesar. It is most probable, however, unless his character was very different from that of every other Ptolemy in the line, that what really awakened his jealousy and anger was fear of the commanding influence and power to which Cleopatra was likely to attain through the agency of so distinguished a protector, 
rather than any other consequences of his friendship or any real considerations of delicacy in respect to his sister's good name or his own marital honour however this may be ptolemy together with pothinus and achillus and all his other friends and adherents who joined him in the terrible outcry that he made against the coalition which he had discovered between cleopatra and caesar succeeded in producing a very general and violent tumult throughout the city the populace were aroused and began to assemble in great crowds full of indignation and anger some knew the facts and acted under something like an understanding of the cause of their anger others only knew that the aim of this sudden outbreak was to assault the romans and were ready on any pretext known or unknown to join in any deeds of violence directed against these foreign intruders there were others still and these probably far the larger portion who knew nothing and understood nothing but that there was to be a tumult and a riot in and around the palaces and were accordingly eager to be there ptolemy and his officers had no large body of troops in alexandria for the events which had thus far occurred since caesar's arrival had succeeded each other so rapidly that a very short time had yet elapsed and the main army remained still at pelusium the main force therefore by which caesar was now attacked consisted of the population of the city headed perhaps by the few guards which the young king had at his command caesar on his part had but a small portion of his forces at the palace where he was attacked the rest were scattered about the city he however seems to have felt no alarm he did not even confine himself to acting on the defensive he sent out a detachment of his soldiers with orders to seize ptolemy and bring him in a prisoner soldiers trained disciplined and armed as the roman veterans were and nerved by the ardor and enthusiasm which seemed always to animate troops which were under caesar's personal command could accomplish almost any undertaking against a mere populace however numerous or however furiously excited they might be the soldiers sallied out seized ptolemy and brought him in the populace were at first astounded at the daring presumption of this deed and then exasperated at the indignity of it considered as a violation of the person of their sovereign the tumult would have greatly increased had it not been that caesar who had now attained all his ends in thus having brought cleopatra and ptolemy both within his power thought it most expedient to allay it he accordingly ascended to the window of a tower or of some other elevated portion of his palace so high that missiles from the mob below could not reach him and began to make signals expressive of his wish to address them when silence was obtained he made them a speech well calculated to quiet the excitement he told them that he did not pretend to any right to judge between cleopatra and ptolemy as their superior but only in the performance of the duty solemnly assigned by ptolemy auletes the father to the roman people whose representative he was other than this he claimed no jurisdiction in the case and his only wish in the discharge of the duty which devolved upon him to consider the cause was to settle the question in a manner just and equitable to all the parties concerned and thus arrest the progress of the civil war which if not arrested threatened to involve the country in the most terrible calamities he counseled them therefore to disperse and no longer disturb the peace of the city he would immediately take measures for trying the question between cleopatra and ptolemy and he did not doubt but that they would all be satisfied with his decision this speech made as it was in the eloquent and persuasive and yet dignified and imposing manner for which caesar's harangues to turbulent assemblies like these were so famed produced a great effect some were convinced others were silenced and those whose resentment and anger were not appeased found themselves deprived of their power by the pacification of the rest the mob was dispersed and ptolemy remained with cleopatra in caesar's custody the next day caesar according to his promise convened an assembly of the principal people of alexandria and officers of state and then brought out ptolemy and cleopatra that he might decide their cause the original will which ptolemy auletes had executed had been deposited in the public archives of alexandria and carefully preserved there an authentic copy of it had been sent to rome caesar caused the original will to be brought out and read to the assembly the provisions of it were perfectly explicit and clear it required that cleopatra and ptolemy should be married and then settled the sovereign power upon them jointly as king and queen it recognized the roman commonwealth as the ally of egypt and constituted the roman government the executor of the will and the guardian of the king and queen in fact so clear and explicit was this document that the simple reading of it seemed to be of itself a decision of the question when therefore caesar announced that in his judgment cleopatra was entitled to share the supreme power with ptolemy and that it was his duty as the representative of the roman power and the executor of the will 
to protect both the king and the queen in their respective rights, there seemed to be nothing that could be said against his decision. Besides Cleopatra and Ptolemy, there were two other children of Ptolemy Auletes in the royal family at this time. One was a girl named Arsinoe, the other, a boy, was, singularly enough, named, like his brother, Ptolemy. These children were quite young, but Caesar thought that it would perhaps gratify the Alexandrians, and lead them to acquiesce more readily in his decision, if he were to make some royal provision for them. He accordingly proposed to assign the island of Cyprus as a realm for them. This was literally a gift, for Cyprus was at this time a Roman possession. The whole assembly seemed satisfied with this decision, except Pothinus. He had been so determined and inveterate an enemy to Cleopatra, that, as he was well aware, her restoration must end in his downfall and ruin. He went away from the assembly, moodily determining that he would not submit to the decision, but would immediately adopt efficient measures to prevent its being carried into effect. Caesar made arrangements for a series of festivals and celebrations, to commemorate and confirm the re-establishment of a good understanding between the king and the queen, and the consequent termination of the war. Such celebrations, he judged, would have great influence in removing any remaining animosities from the minds of the people, and restore the dominion of a kind and friendly feeling throughout the city. The people fell in with these measures, and cordially cooperated to give them effect. But Pothinus and Achilles, though they suppressed all outward expressions of discontentment, made incessant efforts in secret to organize a party, and to form plans for overthrowing the influence of Caesar, and making Ptolemy again the sole and exclusive sovereign. Pothinus represented to all whom he could induce to listen to him that Caesar's real design was to make Cleopatra queen alone, and to depose Ptolemy, and urge them to combine with him to resist a policy which would end in bringing Egypt under the dominion of a woman. He also formed a plan, in connection with Achilles, for ordering the army back from Pelusium. The army consisted of thirty thousand men. If that army could be brought to Alexandria and kept under Pothinus's orders, Caesar and his three thousand Roman soldiers would be, they thought, wholly at their mercy. There was, however, one danger to be guarded against in ordering the army to march toward the capital, and that was that Ptolemy, while under Caesar's influence, might open communication with the officers, and so obtain command of its movements, and thwart all the conspirators' designs. To prevent this, it was arranged between Pothinus and Achilles that the latter should make his escape from Alexandria, proceed immediately to the camp at Pelusium, resume the command of the troops there, and conduct them himself to the capital, and that in all these operations, and also subsequently on his arrival, he should obey no orders unless they came to him through Pothinus himself. Although sentinels and guards were probably stationed at the gates and avenues leading from the city, Achilles contrived to effect his escape and join the army. He placed himself at the head of the forces, and commenced his march toward the capital. Pothinus remained all the time within the city as a spy, pretending to acquiesce in Caesar's decision, and to be on friendly terms with him, but really plotting for his overthrow, and obtaining all the information which his position enabled him to command, in order that he might cooperate with the army and Achilles when they should arrive. All these things were done with the utmost secrecy, and so cunning and adroit were the conspirators, in forming and executing their plots, that Caesar seems to have had no knowledge of the measures which his enemies were taking, until he suddenly heard that the main body of Ptolemy's army was approaching the city, at least twenty thousand strong. In the meantime, however, the forces which he had sent for from Syria had not arrived, and no alternative was left but to defend the capital and himself as well as he could with the very small force which he had at his disposal. He determined, however, first, to try the effect of orders sent out in Ptolemy's name, to forbid the approach of the army to the city. Two officers were accordingly entrusted with these orders, and sent out to communicate them to Achilles. The names of these officers were Dioscorides and Serapion. It shows in a very striking point of view to what an incredible exaltation the authority and consequence of a sovereign king rose in those ancient days, in the minds of men, that Achilles, at the moment when these men made their appearance in the camp, bearing evidently some command from Ptolemy in the city, considered it more prudent to kill them at once, without hearing their message, rather than to allow the orders to be delivered and then take the responsibility of disobeying them. If he could succeed in marching to Alexandria and in taking possession of the city, and then in expelling Caesar and Cleopatra and restoring Ptolemy to the exclusive possession of the throne. He knew very well that the king would rejoice in the result, and would overlook all irregularities on his part in the means by which he had accomplished it, short of absolute disobedience of a known command. 
whatever might be the commands that these messengers were bringing him, he supposed that they doubtless originated not in Ptolemy's own free will, but that they were dictated by the authority of Caesar. Still, they would be commands coming in Ptolemy's name, and the universal experience of officers serving under the military despots of those ancient days showed that, rather than to take the responsibility of directly disobeying a royal order once received, it was safer to avoid receiving it by murdering the messengers. Achilles, therefore, directed the officers to be seized and slain. They were accordingly taken off and speared by the soldiers, and then the bodies were borne away. The soldiers, however, it was found, had not done their work effectually. There was no interest for them in such a cold-blooded assassination, and perhaps something like a sentiment of compassion restrained their hands. At any rate, though both the men were desperately wounded, only one died. The other lived and recovered. Achilles continued to advance toward the city. Caesar, finding that the crisis which was approaching was becoming very serious in its character, took himself the whole command within the capital, and began to make the best arrangements possible under the circumstances of the case to defend himself there. His numbers were altogether too small to defend the whole city against the overwhelming force which was advancing to assail it. He accordingly entrenched his troops in the palaces and in the citadel, and in such other parts of the city as it seemed practicable to defend. He barricaded all the streets and avenues leading to these points, and fortified the gates. Nor did he, while thus doing all in his power to employ the insufficient means of defense already in his hands to the best advantage, neglect the proper exertions for obtaining succor from abroad. He sent off galleys to Syria, to Cyprus, to Rhodes, and to every other point accessible from Alexandria, where Roman troops might be expected to be found, urging the authorities there to forward reinforcements to him with the utmost possible dispatch. During all this time Cleopatra and Ptolemy remained in the palace with Caesar, both ostensibly cooperating with him in his counsels and measures for defending the city from Achilles. Cleopatra, of course, was sincere and earnest in this cooperation, but Ptolemy's adhesion to the common cause was very little to be relied upon. Although, situated as he was, he was compelled to seem to be on Caesar's side, he must have secretly desired that Achilles should succeed and Caesar's plans be overthrown. Pothinus was more active, though not less cautious in his hostility to them. He opened secret communication with Achilles, sending him information from time to time of what took place within the walls, and of the arrangements made there for the defense of the city against him, and gave him also directions how to proceed. He was very wary and sagacious in all these movements, feigning all the time to be on Caesar's side. He pretended to be very zealously employed in aiding Caesar, to secure more effectually the various points where attacks were to be expected, and in maturing and completing the arrangements for defense. But, notwithstanding all his cunning, he was detected in his double dealing, and his career was suddenly brought to a close before the great final conflict came on. There was a barber in Caesar's household, who, for some reason or other, began to suspect Pothinus, and, having little else to do, he employed himself in watching the eunuch's movements and reporting them to Caesar. Caesar directed the barber to continue his observations. He did so, his suspicions were soon confirmed, and at length the letter which Pothinus had written to Achilles was intercepted and brought to Caesar. This furnished the necessary proof of what they called his guilt, and Caesar ordered him to be beheaded. This circumstance produced, of course, a great excitement within the palace, for Pothinus had been for many years the great ruling minister of state, the king, in fact, in all but in name. His execution alarmed a great many others who, though in Caesar's power, were secretly wishing that Achilles might prevail. Among those most disturbed by these fears was a man named Ganymede. He was the officer who had charge of Arsinoe, Cleopatra's sister. The arrangement which Caesar had proposed for establishing her in conjunction with her brother Ptolemy over the island of Cyprus had not gone into effect, for immediately after the decision of Caesar, the attention of all concerned had been wholly engrossed by the tidings of the advance of the army, and by the busy preparations which were required on all hands for the impending contest. Arsinoe, therefore, with her governor Ganymede, remained in the palace. Ganymede had joined Pothinus in his plots, and when Pothinus was beheaded, he concluded that it would be safest for him to fly. He accordingly resolved to make his escape from the city, taking Arsinoe with him. It was a very hazardous attempt, but he succeeded in accomplishing it. Arsinoe was very willing to go, for she was now beginning to be old enough to feel the impulse of that insatiable and reckless ambition which seemed to form such an essential element in the character of every son and daughter in the whole Ptolemaic line. She was insignificant and powerless where she was, but at the head of the army she might become immediately a queen. It resulted in the first instance, as she had anticipated. Achilles and his army received her with acclamations. 
Under Ganymede's influence they decided that, as all the other members of the royal family were in durance, being held captive by a foreign general, who had by chance obtained possession of the capital, and were thus incapacitated for exercising the royal power, the crown devolved upon Arsinoe, and they accordingly proclaimed her queen. Everything was now prepared for a desperate and determined contest for the crown between Cleopatra, with Caesar for her minister in general, on the one side, and Arsinoe, with Ganymede and Achilles for her chief officers on the other. The young Ptolemy, in the meantime, remained Caesar's prisoner, confused with the intricacies in which the quarrel had become involved, and scarcely knowing now what to wish in respect to the issue of the contest. It was very difficult to foresee whether it would be best for him that Cleopatra or that Arsinoe should succeed. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Cleopatra This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan Cleopatra by Jacob Abbott Chapter 7 The Alexandrine War Forces of Caesar The Egyptian Army Fugitive Slaves Dangerous Situation of Caesar Presence of Caesar Influence of Cleopatra First Measures of Caesar Caesar's stores, military engines, the mole, view of Alexandria, necessity of taking possession of the mole, Egyptian fleet, Caesar burns the shipping, the fort taken, burning of Alexandria, Achilles beheaded, plans of Ganymede, his vigorous measures, Messengers of Ganymede Their instructions Ganymede cuts off Caesar's supply of water Panic of the soldiers Caesar's wells Arrival of the transports The transports in distress Lowness of the coast A combat Caesar successful Ganymede equips a fleet A naval conflict Caesar in danger. Another victory. The Egyptians discouraged. Secret messengers. Dissimulation of Ptolemy. Arrival of Mithridates. Defeat of Ptolemy. Terror and confusion. Death of Ptolemy. Cleopatra Queen. General disappropriation of Caesar's course. Cleopatra's son, Caesarian, public opinion of her conduct. Caesar departs for Rome. He takes Arsinoe with him. The war which ensued as the result of the intrigues and maneuvers described in the last chapter is known in the history of Rome and Julius Caesar as the Alexandrine War. The events which occurred during the progress of it and its termination at last in the triumph of Caesar and Cleopatra will form the subject of this chapter. Achilles had greatly the advantage over Caesar at the outset of the contest in respect to the strength of the forces under his command. Caesar, in fact, had with him only a detachment of three or four thousand men, a small body of troops, which he had hastily put on board a little squadron of Rhodian galleys for pursuing Pompey across the Mediterranean. When he set sail from the European shores with his inconsiderable fleet, it is probable that he had no expectation of even landing in Egypt at all, and much less of being involved in great military undertakings there. Achilles, on the other hand, was at the head of a force of twenty thousand effective men. His troops were, it is true, of a somewhat miscellaneous character, but they were all veteran soldiers, inured to the climate of Egypt, and skilled in all the modes of warfare which were suited to the character of the country. Some of them were Roman soldiers, 
men who had come with the army of Mark Anthony from Syria, when Ptolemy Aulides, Cleopatra's father, was reinstated on the throne, and had been left in Egypt in Ptolemy's service when Anthony returned to Rome. Some were native Egyptians. There was also in the army of Achilles a large number of fugitive slaves, refugees who had made their escape from various points along the shores of the Mediterranean at different periods, and had been from time to time incorporated into the Egyptian army. These fugitives were all men of the most determined and desperate character. Achilles had also in his command a force of two thousand horse. Such a body of cavalry made him, of course, perfect master of all the open country outside the city walls. At the head of these troops Achilles gradually advanced to the very gates of Alexandria, invested the city on every side, and shut Caesar closely in. The danger of the situation in which Caesar was placed was extreme, but he had been so accustomed to succeed in extricating himself from the most imminent perils that neither he himself nor his army seemed to have experienced any concern in respect to the result. Caesar personally felt a special pride and pleasure in encountering the difficulties and dangers which now beset him, because Cleopatra was with him to witness his demeanor to admire his energy and courage, and to reward by her love the efforts and sacrifices which he was making in espousing her cause. She confided everything to him, but she watched all the proceedings with the most eager interest, elated with hope in respect to the result, and proud of the champion who had thus volunteered to defend her. In a word, her heart was full of gratitude, admiration, and love. The immediate effect, too, of the emotions which she felt so strongly was greatly to heighten her natural charms. The native force and energy of her character were softened and subdued. Her voice, which always possessed a certain inexpressible charm, was endued with the new sweetness through the influence of affection. Her countenance beamed with fresh animation and beauty and the sprightliness and vivacity of her character, which became at later periods of her life boldness and eccentricity, now being softened and restrained within proper limits by the respectful regard with which she looked upon Caesar, made her an enchanting companion. Caesar was, in fact, entirely intoxicated with the fascinations which she unconsciously displayed. Under other circumstances than these, a personal attachment so strong, formed by a military commander while engaged in active service, might have been expected to interfere in some degree with the discharge of his duties. But in this case, since it was for Cleopatra's sake and her behalf that the operations which Caesar had undertaken were to be prosecuted, his love for her only stimulated the spirit and energy with which he engaged in them. The first measure to be adopted was, as Caesar plainly perceived, to concentrate and strengthen his position in the city, so that he might be able to defend himself there against Achilles until he should receive reinforcements from abroad. For this purpose he selected a certain group of palaces and citadels, which lay together near the head of the long pier of causeway which led to the Pharos and withdrawing his troops from all other parts of the city, established them there. The quarter which he thus occupied contained the great city arsenals and public granaries. Caesar brought together all the arms and munitions of war which he could find in other parts of the city, and also all the corn and other provisions which were contained either in the public depots or in private warehouses and stored the whole within his lines. He then enclosed the whole quarter with strong defenses. The avenues leading to it were barricaded with walls of stone. Houses in the vicinity, which might have afforded shelter to an enemy, were demolished and the materials used in constructing walls wherever they were needed, or in strengthening the barricades. Prodigious military engines 
made to throw heavy stones and beams of wood and other ponderous missiles, were set up within his lines, and openings were made in the walls and other defenses of the citadel, wherever necessary, to facilitate the action of these machines. There was a strong fortress situated at the head of the pier, or mole leading to the island of Pharos, which was without Caesar's lines, and still in the hands of the Egyptian authorities. The Egyptians thus commanded the entrance to the mole, the island itself also, with the fortress at the other end of the pier, was still in the possession of the Egyptian authorities, who seemed disposed to hold it for Achilles. The mole was very long, as the island was nearly a mile from the shore. There was quite a little town upon the island itself, besides the fortress or castle built there to defend the place. The garrison of this castle was strong, and the inhabitants of the town, too, constituted a somewhat formidable population, as they consisted of fishermen, sailors, wreckers, and such other desperate characters as usually congregate about such a spot. Cleopatra and Caesar, from the windows of their palace within the city, looked out upon this island, with the tall lighthouse rising in the center of it, and the castle at its base, and upon the long and narrow isthmus connecting it with the mainland, and concluded that it was very essential that they should get possession of the post commanding, as it did, the entrance to the harbor. In the harbor, which was on the south side of the mole, and consequently on the side opposite to that which Achilles was advancing toward the city, there were lying a large number of Egyptian vessels, some dismantled, and others manned and armed more or less effectively. These vessels had not yet come into Achilles's hands, but it would be certain that he would take possession of them as soon as he should gain admittance to those parts of the city which Caesar had abandoned. This was extremely important to prevent, for if Achilles held this fleet, especially if he continued to command the island of Pharos, he would be perfect master of all the approaches to the city on the side of the sea. He could then not only receive reinforcements and supplies himself from that quarter, but he could also effectually cut off the Roman army from all possibility of receiving any. It became, therefore, as Caesar thought, imperiously necessary that he should protect himself from this danger. This he did by sending out an expedition to burn all the shipping in the harbor, and, at the same time, to take possession of a certain fort upon the island of Ferris, which commanded the entrance to the port. This undertaking was abundantly successful. The troops burned the shipping, took the fort, expelled the Egyptian soldiers from it, and put a Roman garrison into it instead, and then returned in safety within Caesar's lines. Cleopatra witnessed these exploits from her palace windows with feelings of the highest admiration for the energy and valor which her Roman protectors displayed. The burning of the Egyptian ships in this action, however fortunate for Cleopatra and Caesar, was attended with a catastrophe which has ever since been lamented by the whole civilized world. Some of the burning ships were driven by the wind to the shore, where they set fire to the buildings which were contiguous to the water. The flames spread and produced an extensive conflagration, in the course of which the largest part of the great library was destroyed. This library was the only general collection of the ancient writings that had ever been made, and the loss of it was never repaired. The destruction of the Egyptian fleet resulted also in the downfall and ruin of Achilles. From the time of Arsinoe's arrival in the camp, there had been a constant rivalry and jealousy between himself and Ganymede, the eunuch who had accompanied Arsinoe in her flight. Two parties had been formed in the army, some declaring for Achilles and some for Ganymede. Arsinoe advocated Ganymede's interests, and when, at length, the fleet was burned, she charged Achilles with having been, by his neglect or incapacity, the cause of the loss. Achilles was tried, condemned, and beheaded. From that time, Ganymede assumed the administration of Arsinoe's government as her minister of state and the commander-in-chief of her armies. About the time that these occurrences took place, the Egyptian army advanced into those parts of the city 
from which Caesar had withdrawn, producing those terrible scenes of panic and confusion which always attend a sudden and violent change of military possession within the precincts of a city. Ganymede brought up his troops on every side to the walls of Caesar's citadels and entrenchments, and hemmed him closely in. He cut off all avenues of approach to Caesar's lines by land, and commenced vigorous preparations for an assault. He constructed engines for battering down walls, he opened shops and established forges in every part of the city for the manufacture of darts, spears, pikes, and all kinds of military machinery. He built towers supported upon huge wheels with the design of filling them with armed men, when readily available to make his assault upon Caesar's lines, and moving them up to the walls of the citadels and palaces, so as to give his soldiers the advantage of a lofty elevation in making their attacks. He levied contributions on the rich citizens for the necessary funds, and provided himself with men by pressing all the artisans, laborers, and men capable of bearing arms into his service. He sent messengers back into the interior of the country, in every direction, summoning the people to arms, and calling for contributions of money and military stores. These messengers were instructed to urge upon the people that, unless Caesar and his army were at once expelled from Alexandria, there was imminent danger that the national independence of Egypt would be forever destroyed. The Romans, they were to say, had extended their conquests over almost all the rest of the world. They had sent one army into Egypt before, under the command of Mark Antony, under the pretense of restoring Ptolemy Olites to the throne. Now another commander, with another force, had come, offering some other pretext for interfering in their affairs. These Roman encroachments, the messengers were to say, would end in the complete subjugation of Egypt to a foreign power, unless the people of the country aroused themselves to meet the danger manfully and to expel the intruders. For some time the army within could not understand these changes, and when, at length, they discovered the cause, the soldiers were panic-stricken at the thought that they were now, apparently, wholly at the mercy of their enemies, since, without supplies of water, they must all immediately perish. They considered it hopeless to attempt any longer to hold out, and urged Caesar to evacuate the city, embark on board his galleys, and proceed to sea. Instead of doing this, however, Caesar, ordering all other operations to be suspended, employed the whole laboring force of his command, under the direction of the captains of the several companies, in digging wells in every part of his quarter of the city. Fresh water, he said, was almost invariably found, at a moderate depth, upon sea coasts, even upon ground lying in very close proximity to the sea. The digging was successful fresh water in great abundance was found. Thus this danger was passed, and the men's fears effectually relieved. A short time after these transactions occurred, there came into the harbor one day, from along the shore west of the city, a small sloop, bringing the intelligence that a squadron of transports had arrived upon the coast to the westward of Alexandria, and had anchored there, being unable to come up to the city on account of an easterly wind which prevailed that season of the year. This squadron was one which had been sent across the Mediterranean with arms, ammunition, and military stores for Caesar, in answer to requisitions which he had made immediately after he had landed. The transports being thus wind-bound on the coast, and having nearly exhausted their supplies of water, were in distress and they accordingly sent forward the sloop, which was probably propelled by oars, to make known their situation to Caesar, and to ask for succor. Caesar immediately went, himself, on board one of his galleys, and ordering the remainder of his little fleet to follow him, he set sail out of the harbor, and then turned to the westward, with a view of proceeding along the coast to the place where the transports were lying. All this was done secretly. The land is so low in the vicinity of Alexandria 
that boats or galleys are out of sight from it at a very short distance from the shore. In fact, travelers say that, in coming upon the coast, the illusion produced by the spherical form of the surface of the water and the low and level character of the coast is such that one seems actually to descend from the sea to the land. Caesar might, therefore, have easily kept his expedition a secret, had it not been that, in order to be provided with a supply of water for the transports immediately on reaching them, he stopped at a solitary part of the coast, at some distance from Alexandria, and sent a party a little way into the interior in search for water. This party were discovered by the country people, and was intercepted by a troop of horse and made prisoners. From these prisoners the Egyptians learned that Caesar himself was on the coast with a small squadron of galleys. The tidings spread in all directions. The people flocked together from every quarter. They hastily collected all the boats and vessels which could be obtained at the villages in that region and from the various branches of the Nile. In the meantime, Caesar had gone on to the anchorage ground of the squadron and had taken the transports in tow to bring them to the city, for the galleys, being propelled by oars, were in a measure independent of the wind. On his return, he found quite a formidable naval armament assembled to dispute the passage. A severe conflict ensued, but Caesar was victorious. The navy which the Egyptians had so suddenly got together was as suddenly destroyed. Some of the vessels were burned, others sunk, and others captured, and Caesar returned in triumph to the port with his transports and stores. He was welcomed with the acclamations of his soldiers, and still more warmly by the joy and gratitude of Cleopatra, who had been waiting during his absence in great anxiety and suspense to know the result of the expedition, aware as she was that her hero was exposing himself in it to the most imminent personal danger. The arrival of these reinforcements greatly improved Caesar's condition, and the circumstance of their coming forced upon the mind of Ganymede a sense of the absolute necessity that he should gain possession of the harbor if he intended to keep Caesar in check. He accordingly determined to take immediate measures for forming a naval force. He sent along the coast and ordered every ship and galley that could be found in all the ports to be sent immediately to Alexandria. He employed as many men as possible in and around the city in building more. He unroofed some of the most magnificent edifices to procure timber as a material for making benches and oars. When all was ready, he made a grand attack upon Caesar in the port, and a terrible contest ensued for the possession of the harbor, the mole, the island, and the citadels and fortresses commanding the entrances from the sea. Caesar well knew this contest would be a decisive one in respect to the final result of the war, and he accordingly went forth himself to take an active and personal part in the conflict. He felt doubtless, too, a strong emotion of pride and pleasure in exhibiting his prowess in the sight of Cleopatra, who could watch the progress of the battle from the palace windows, full of excitement at the dangers which he incurred, and of admiration at the feats of strength and valor which he performed. During this battle, the life of the great conqueror was several times in the most imminent danger. He wore a habit or mantle of the imperial purple, which made him a conspicuous mark for his enemies, and of course, wherever he went, in that place was the hottest of the fight. Once, in the midst of a scene of most dreadful confusion and din, he leaped from an overloaded boat into the water and swam for his life, holding his cloak between his teeth and drawing it through the water after him, that it might not fall into the hands of his enemies. He carried, at the same time as he swam, certain valuable papers which he wished to save, holding them above his head with one hand, while he propelled himself through the water with the other. The result of this contest was another decisive victory for Caesar. Not only were the ships which the Egyptians had collected defeated and destroyed, but the mole, with the fortresses at each extremity of it, and the island, 
with the lighthouse and the town of Pharos, all fell into Caesar's hands. The Egyptians now began to be discouraged, the army and the people, judging, as mankind always do, of the virtue of their military commanders, solely by the criterion of success, began to be tired of the rule of Ganymede and Arsinoe. They sent secret messengers to Caesar, avowing their discontent, and saying that, if he would liberate Ptolemy, who, it will be recollected, had been all this time held as sort of a prisoner of state in Caesar's palaces, they thought that the people generally would receive him as their sovereign, and that then an arrangement might easily be made for an amicable adjustment of the whole controversy. Caesar was strongly inclined to accede to this proposal. He accordingly called Ptolemy into his presence, and taking him kindly by the hand, informed him of the wishes of the people of Egypt, and gave him permission to go. Ptolemy, however, begged not to be sent away. He professed the strongest attachment to Caesar, and the utmost confidence in him, and he very much preferred, he said, to remain under his protection. Caesar replied that, if those were his sentiments, the separation would not be a lasting one. If we part as friends, he said, we shall soon meet again. By these and similar assurances, he endeavored to encourage the young prince, and then sent him away. Ptolemy was received by the Egyptians with great joy, and was immediately placed at the head of the government. Instead, however, of endeavoring to promote a settlement of the quarrel with Caesar, he seemed to enter into it now himself, personally, with the utmost ardor, and began at once to make the most extensive preparations, both by sea and land, for a vigorous prosecution of the war. What the result of these operations would have been can now not be known, for the general aspect of affairs was, soon after these transactions, totally changed by the occurrence of a new and very important event which suddenly intervened, and which turned the attention of all parties, both Egyptians and Romans, to the eastern quarter of the kingdom. The tidings arrived that a large army under the command of a general named Mithridates, whom Caesar had dispatched into Asia for this purpose, had suddenly appeared at Pelusium, had captured that city, and were now ready to march to Alexandria. The Egyptian army immediately broke up its encampments in the neighborhood of Alexandria, and marched to the eastward to meet these new invaders. Caesar followed them with all the forces that he could safely take away from the city. He left the city in the night, and unobserved moved across the country with such celerity that he joined Mithridates before the forces of Ptolemy had arrived. After various marches and maneuvers, the armies met, and a great battle was fought. The Egyptians were defeated. Ptolemy's camp was taken. As the Roman army burst in upon one side of it, the guards and attendants of Ptolemy fled upon the other, clamoring over the ramparts in the utmost terror and confusion. The foremost fell headlong into the ditch below, which was thus soon filled to the brim with the dead and dying, while those who came behind pressed on over the bridge thus formed, trampling remorselessly as they fled on the bodies of their comrades who lay writhing, struggling, and shrieking beneath their feet. Those who escaped reached the river. They crowded together into a boat which lay at the bank and pushed off from the shore. The boat was overloaded, and it sank as soon as it left the land. The Romans drew the bodies which floated to the shore upon the bank again, and they found among them one which, by the royal cuirass which was upon it, the customary badge and armor of the Egyptian kings, they knew to be the body of Ptolemy. The victory which Caesar obtained in this battle and the death of Ptolemy ended the war. Nothing now remained but for him to place himself at the head of the combined forces and march back to Alexandria. The Egyptian forces, which had been left there, made no resistance, and he entered the city in triumph. He took Arsinoe prisoner. He decreed that Cleopatra should reign as queen, and that she should marry her youngest brother, the other Ptolemy, a boy at this time about eleven years of age. A marriage with one so young was, of course, a mere form. Cleopatra remained, as before, the companion of Caesar. Caesar had, in the meantime, incurred great censure at Rome, and throughout the whole Roman world, 
for having thus turned aside from his own proper duties as the roman consul and the commander-in-chief of the armies of the empire to embroil himself in the quarrels of a remote and secluded kingdom with which the interests of the roman commonwealth were so little connected his friends and the authorities at rome were continually urging him to return they were especially indignant at his protracted neglect of his own proper duties from knowing that he was held in egypt by a guilty attachment to the queen thus not only violating his obligations to the state but likewise inflicting upon his wife calpurnia and his family at rome an intolerable wrong but caesar was so fascinated by cleopatra's charms and by the mysterious and unaccountable influence which she exercised over him that he paid no heed to any of these remonstrances even after the war was ended he remained some months in egypt to enjoy his favorite's society he would spend whole nights in her company in feasting and revelry he made a splendid royal progress with her through egypt after the war was over attended by a numerous train of roman guards he formed a plan for taking her to rome and marrying her there and he took measures for having the laws of the city altered so as to enable him to do so though he was already married all these things produced great discontent and disaffection among caesar's friends and throughout the roman army the egyptians too strongly censured the conduct of cleopatra a son was born to her about this time whom the alexandrians named from his father caesarian cleopatra was regarded in the new relation of mother which she now sustained not with interest and sympathy but with feelings of reproach and condemnation cleopatra was all this time growing more and more accomplished and more and more beautiful but her vivacity and spirit which had been so charming while it was simple and childlike now began to appear more forward and bold it is the characteristic of pure and lawful love to soften and subdue the heart and infuse a gentle and quiet spirit into all its action while that which breaks over the barriers that god and nature have marked out for it tends to make women masculine and bold to injure it all her sensibilities and to destroy that gentleness and timidity of demeanor which have so great an influence in heightening her charms cleopatra was beginning to experience these effects she was indifferent to the opinions of her subjects and was only anxious to maintain as long as possible her guilty ascendancy over caesar caesar however finally determined to set out on his return to the capital leaving cleopatra accordingly a sufficient force to secure the continuance of her power he embarked the remainder of his forces in his transports and galleys and sailed away he took the unhappy arsinoe with him intending to exhibit her as a trophy to his egyptian victories on his arrival at rome End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. C. Y. Cleopatra by Jacob Abbott. Chapter Eight, Cleopatra, a Queen. The Alexandrian War very short. Its extent, revenues of Egypt the city repaired the library rebuilt a new collection of manuscripts luxury and splendor deterioration of cleopatra's character the young ptolemy cleopatra assassinates him career of caesar his rapid course of conquest cleopatra determines to go to rome feelings of the romans caesar's four triumphs nature of triumphal procession Arsinoe, sympathy of the Roman people, Caesar overacts his part, feasts and festivals, riot and debauchery, public combats, the artificial lake, combat upon it, land combats, the people shocked, Cleopatra's visit, Caesar's plans for making himself king, conspiracy against Caesar, he is assassinated, Arsinoe released. Calpurnia mourns her husband's death. Calpurnia looks to Mark Antony as her protector. 
the war by which caesar reinstated cleopatra upon the throne was not one of very long duration caesar arrived in egypt in pursuit of pompey about the first of august the war was ended and cleopatra established in secure possession by the end of january so that the conflict violent as it was while it continued was very brief the peaceful and commercial pursuits of the alexandrians having been interrupted by it only for a few months nor did either the war itself or the derangements consequent upon it extend very far into the interior of the country the city of alexandria itself and the neighboring coasts were the chief scenes of the contest until mithridates arrived at pelusium he it is true marched across the delta and the final battle was fought in the interior of the country it was however after all but a very small portion of the egyptian territory that was directly affected by the war the great mass of the people occupying the rich and fertile tracts which bordered the various branches of the nile and the long and verdant valley which extended so far into the heart of the continent knew nothing of the conflict but by vague and distant rumours the pursuits of the agricultural population went on all the time as steadily and prosperously as ever so that when the conflict was ended and cleopatra entered upon the quiet and peaceful possession of her power she found that the resources of her empire were very little impaired she availed herself accordingly of the revenues which poured in very abundantly upon her to enter upon a career of the greatest luxury magnificence and splendor the injuries which had been done to the palaces and other public edifices of alexandria by the fire and by the military operations of the siege were repaired the bridges which had been down were rebuilt the canals which had been obstructed were opened again the sea-water was shut off from the palace cisterns the rubbish of demolished houses was removed the barricades were cleared from the streets and the injuries which the palaces had suffered either from the violence of military engines or the rough occupations of the roman soldiery were repaired in a word the city was speedily restored once more so far as was possible to its former order and beauty the five hundred thousand manuscripts of the alexandrian library which had been burned could not indeed be restored but in all other respects the city soon resumed in appearance all its former splendor even in respect to the library cleopatra made an effort to retrieve the loss she repaired the ruined buildings and afterward in the course of her life she brought together it was said in a manner hereafter to be described one or two hundred thousand rolls of manuscripts as the commencement of a new collection the new library however never acquired the fame and distinction that had pertained to the old the former sovereigns of egypt cleopatra's ancestors had generally as has already been shown devoted the immense revenues which they extorted from the agriculturalists of the valley of the nile to purposes of ambition cleopatra seemed now disposed to expend them in luxury and pleasure they the ptolemies had employed their resources in erecting vast structures or founding magnificent institutions at alexandria to add to the glory of the city and to widen and extend their own fame cleopatra on the other hand as was perhaps naturally to be expected of a young beautiful and impulsive woman suddenly raised to so conspicuous a position and to the possession of such unbounded wealth and power expended her royal revenues in plans of personal display and in scenes of festivity gaiety and enjoyment she adorned her palaces built magnificent barges for pleasure excursions on the nile and expended enormous sums for dress for equipages and for sumptuous entertainments in fact so lavish were her expenditures for these and similar purposes during the early years of her reign that she is considered as having carried the extravagance of sensual luxury and personal display and splendor beyond the limits that had ever before or ever since been attained whatever of simplicity of character 
and of gentleness and kindness of spirit she might have possessed in her earlier years, of course gradually disappeared under the influences of such a course of life as she now was leading. She was beautiful and fascinating still, but she began to grow selfish, heartless, and designing. Her little brother, he was but eleven years of age, it will be recollected, when Caesar arranged the marriage between them, was an object of jealousy to her. He was now, of course, too young to take any actual share in the exercise of the royal power, or to interfere at all in his sister's plans or pleasures. But then he was growing older. In a few years he would be fifteen, which was the period of life fixed upon by Caesar's arrangements, and in fact by the laws and usages of the Egyptian kingdom, when he was to come into possession of power as a king, and as the husband of Cleopatra. Cleopatra was extremely unwilling that the change in her relations to him, and to the government, which this period was to bring, should take place. Accordingly, just before the time arrived, she caused him to be poisoned. His death released her, as she had intended, from all restraints, and thereafter she continued to reign alone. During the remainder of her life, so far as the enjoyment of wealth and power, and of all other elements of external prosperity could go, Cleopatra's career was one of uninterrupted success. She had no conscientious scruples to interfere with the most full and unrestrained indulgence of every propensity of her heart, and the means of indulgence were before her in the most unlimited profusion. The only bar to her happiness was the impossibility of satisfying the impulses and passions of the human soul, when they once break over the bounds which the laws both of God and of nature ordained for restraining them. In the meantime, while Cleopatra was spending the early years of her reign in all this luxury and splendor, Caesar was pursuing his career, as a conqueror of the world, in the most successful manner. On the death of Pompey, he would naturally have succeeded at once to the enjoyment of the supreme power, but his delay in Egypt, and the extent to which it was known that he was entangled with Cleopatra, encouraged and strengthened his enemies in various parts of the world. In fact, a revolt which broke out in Asia Minor, in which it was absolutely necessary that he should proceed at once to quell, was the immediate cause of his leaving Egypt at last. Other plans for making head against Caesar's power were formed in Spain, in Africa, and in Italy. His military skill and energy, however, were so great, and the ascendancy which he exercised over the minds of men by his personal presence was so unbounded, and so astonishing, moreover, was the celerity with which he moved from continent to continent, and from kingdom to kingdom, that in a very short period from the time of his leaving Egypt, he had conducted most brilliant and successful campaigns in all the three quarters of the world then known had put down effectually all opposition to his power, and then had returned to Rome, the acknowledged master of the world. Cleopatra, who had, of course, watered his career during all this time with great pride and pleasure, concluded at last to go to Rome and make a visit to him there. The people of Rome were, however, not prepared to receive her very cordially. It was an age in which vice of every kind was regarded with great indulgence, but the moral instincts of mankind were too strong to be wholly blinded to the true character of so conspicuous an example of wickedness as this. Arsinoe was at Rome, too, during this period of Caesar's life. He had brought her there, it will be recollected, on his return from Egypt, as a prisoner, and as a trophy of his victory. His design was, in fact, to reserve her as a captive to grace his triumph. A triumph, according to the usages of the ancient Romans, was a grand celebration decreed by the Senate to great military commanders of the highest rank, when they returned from distant campaigns in which they had made great conquests or gained extraordinary victories. Caesar concentrated all his triumphs into one. They were celebrated on his return to Rome for the last time, after having completed the conquest of the world. The processions of this triumph occupied four days. In fact, they were four triumphs, one on each day for the four days. The wars and conquests, 
which these ovations were intended to celebrate were those of Gaul, of Egypt, of Asia, and of Africa, and the processions on the several days consisted of endless trains of prisoners, trophies, arms, banners, pictures, images, convoys of wagons loaded with plunder, captive princes and princesses, animals wild and tame, and everything else which the conqueror had been able to bring home with him from his campaigns, to excite the curiosity or the admiration of the people of the city, and illustrate the magnitude of his exploits. Of course, the Roman generals, when engaged in distant foreign wars, were ambitious of bringing back as many distinguished captives and as much public plunder as they were able to obtain, in order to add to the variety and splendor of the triumphal procession by which their victories were to be honored on their return. It was with this view that Caesar brought Arsinoe from Egypt, and he had retained her as his captive at Rome until his conquests were completed and the time for his triumph arrived. She, of course, formed a part of the triumphal train on the Egyptian day. She walked immediately before the chariot in which Caesar rode. She was in chains, like any other captive, though her chains in order of their lofty rank were made of gold. The effect, however, upon the Roman population of seeing the unhappy princess, overwhelmed as she was with sorrow and chagrin, as she moved slowly along in the train, among the other emblems and trophies of violence and plunder, proved to be by no means favorable to Caesar. The population were inclined to pity her, and to sympathize with her in her sufferings. The sight of her distress recalled, too, to their minds the dereliction from duty which Caesar had been guilty of in his yielding to the enticements of Cleopatra, and remaining so long in Egypt to the neglect of his proper duties as a Roman minister of state. In a word, the tide of admiration for Caesar's military exploits, which had been setting so strongly in his favor, seemed inclined to turn, and the city was filled with murmurs against him even in the midst of his triumphs. In fact, the pride and vainglory which led Caesar to make his triumphs more splendid and imposing than any other former conqueror had ever enjoyed, caused him to overact his part so as to produce effects the reverse of his intentions. The case of Arsinoe was one example of this. Instead of impressing the people with a sense of the greatness of his exploits in Egypt, in deposing one queen and bringing her captive to Rome, in order that he might place another upon the throne in her stead, it only reproduced anew the censures and criminations which he had deserved by his actions there, but which, had it not been for the pitiable spectacle of Arsinoe in the train, might have been forgotten. There were other examples of a similar character. There were the feasts, for instance. From the plunder which Caesar had obtained in his various campaigns, he expended the most enormous sums in making feasts and spectacles for the populace, at the time of his triumph. A large portion of the populace was pleased, it is true, with the boundless indulgences thus offered to them, but the better part of the Roman people were indignant at the waste and extravagance which were everywhere displayed. For many days the whole city of Rome presented to the view nothing but one widespread scene of riot and debauchery. The people, instead of being pleased with this abundance, said that Caesar must have practiced the most extreme and lawless extortion to have obtained the vast amount of money necessary to enable him to supply such unbounded and reckless waste. There was another way, too, by which Caesar turned public opinion strongly against himself, by the very means which he adopted for creating a sentiment in his favor. The Romans, among the other barbarous amusements which were practiced in the city, were especially fond of combats. These combats were of various kinds. They were fought sometimes between ferocious beasts of the same or of different species, as dogs against each other, or against bulls, lions, or tigers. Any animals, in fact, were employed for this purpose, that could be teased or goaded into anger and ferocity in a fight. Sometimes men were employed in these combats, captive soldiers that had been taken in war, 
and brought to Rome to fight in the amphitheatres there as gladiators. These men were compelled to contend sometimes with wild beasts, and sometimes with one another. Caesar, knowing how highly the Roman assemblies enjoyed such things, determined to afford them the indulgence on a most magnificent scale, supposing, of course, that the greater and the more dreadful the fight, the higher would be the pleasure which the spectators would enjoy in witnessing it. Accordingly, in making preparations for the festivities attained in his triumph, he caused a large artificial lake to be formed at a convenient place in the vicinity of Rome, where he could be surrounded by the populace of the city, and there he made arrangements for a naval battle. A great number of galleys were introduced into the lake. They were of the usual size employed in war. These galleys were manned with numerous soldiers. Tyrian captives were put upon one side, and Egyptian upon the other, and when all was ready, the two squadrons were ordered to approach and fight a real battle for the amusement of the enormous throngs of spectators that were assembled around. As the nations from which the combatants in this conflict were respectively taken were hostile to each other, and as the men fought a course for their lives, the engagement was attended with the usual horrors of a desperate naval encounter. Hundreds were slain. The dead bodies of the combatants fell from the galleys into the lake, and the waters of it were dyed with their blood. There were land combats, too, on the same grand scale. In one of them five hundred foot soldiers, twenty elephants, and a troop of thirty horses were engaged on each side. This combat, therefore, was an action greater in respect to the number of the combatants than the famous Battle of Lexington, which marked the commencement of the American War and in respect to the slaughter which took place it was very probably ten times greater the horror of these scenes proved to be too much even for the populace fierce and merciless as it was which they were intended to amuse caesar in his eagerness to outdo all former exhibitions and shows went beyond the limits within which the seeing of men butchered in bloody combats and dying in agony and despair would serve for a pleasure and a pastime the people were shocked, and condemnations of Caesar's cruelty were added to the other suppressed reproaches and criminations which everywhere arose. Cleopatra, during her visit to Rome, lived openly with Caesar at his residence, and this excited a very general displeasure. In fact, while the people pitied Arsinoe, Cleopatra, notwithstanding her beauty and her thousand personal accomplishments and charms, was an object of a general displeasure, so far as public attention was turned toward her at all. The public mind was, however, much engrossed by the great political movements made by Caesar, and the ends toward which he seemed to be aiming. Men accused him of designing to be made a king. Parties were formed for and against him and though men did not dare openly to utter their sentiments, their passions became the more violent in proportion to the external force by which they were suppressed. Mark Antony was at Rome at this time. He warmly espoused Caesar's cause, and encouraged his design of making himself king. He once, in fact, offered to place a royal diadem upon Caesar's head at some public celebration, but the marks of public disapprobation which the act elicited caused him to desist. At length, however, the time arrived and Caesar determined to cause himself to be proclaimed king. He took advantage of a certain remarkable conjuncture of public affairs, which cannot here be particularly described, but which seemed to him especially to favor his designs, and arrangements were made for having him invested with irregular power by the Senate. The murmurs and the discontent of the people, and the indications that the time for the realization of their fears was drawing nigh, became more and more audible, and at length a conspiracy was formed to put an end to the danger by destroying the ambitious aspirant's life. Two stern and determined men, Brutus and Cassius, were the leaders of this conspiracy. They matured their plans, organized their band of associates, provided themselves secretly with arms, and when the Senate convened, on the day in which the decisive vote was to have been passed, 
Caesar himself presiding, they came up boldly around him in his presidential chair, and murdered him with their daggers. Antony, from whom the plans of the conspirators had been kept profoundly secret, stood by, looking on stupefied and confounded why the deed was done, but utterly unable to render his friend any protection. Cleopatra immediately fled from the city and returned to Egypt. Arsinoe had gone away before. Caesar, either taking pity of her misfortunes, or impelled perhaps by the force of public sentiment, which seemed inclined to take part with her against him, set her at liberty immediately after the ceremonies of his triumph were over. He would not, however, allow her to return into Egypt for fear, probably, that she might in some way or other be the means of disturbing the government of Cleopatra. She proceeded accordingly into Syria, no longer as a captive, but still as an exile from her native land. We shall hereafter learn what became of her there. Calpurnia mourned the death of her husband with sincere and unaffected grief. She bore the wrongs which she suffered as a wife with a very patient and unrepining spirit. She loved her husband with the most devoted attachment to the end. Nothing can be more affecting than the proofs of her tender and anxious regard on the night immediately preceding the assassination. There were certain slight and obscure indications of danger, which her watchful devotion to her husband led her to observe, though they eluded the notice of all Caesar's other friends, and they filled her with apprehensions and anxiety and when at length the bloody body was brought home to her from the senate house she was overwhelmed with grief and despair she had no children she accordingly looked upon mark antony as her nearest friend and protector and in the confusion and terror which prevailed the next day in the city she hastily packed it together the money and other valuables contained in the house and all her husband's books and papers and sent them to antony for safe keeping End of chapter 8